Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z Podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. This episode we are reading Archaeological Investigations from the Bureau of American Ethnology, Bulletin 76, written by Gerard Falk, printed in 1922. Gerard Falk was an American archaeologist and geologist best known for his studies of Native American mounds. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Smithsonian Institution Bureau of American Ethnology Bulletin 76 Archaeological Investigations By Gerard Falk The geological structure of that portion of southern Missouri which lies to the westward of the Archean rocks near the Mississippi River is peculiarly suitable for the development of caverns. The Ozark uplift produced far-reaching undulations and there seemed to have been no violent disturbances which would result in extensive faults, considerable displacements, or a pronounced inclination of the strata. Jointing and pressure cleavage, however, gave rise to innumerable crevices in the limestone through which percolating surface water found its way into all parts of the formations. By its solvent power this water gradually enlarged the crevices into passages which, multiplying and uniting, drained constantly increasing areas until they formed subterranean streams with a perpetual flow. Thus began caverns, and these grew in depth, width, and height as the rock was eroded and dissolved. Tributary crevices were subject to the same action, and there was finally created by each of these water systems a network of cavities whose ramifications sometimes extend throughout several townships. In time, sections of the roof, here and there, became so thin from the combined erosion taking place both above and below as to be unable to sustain their own weight, the overlying strata fell into the cave, and the volume of water flowing through was augmented by drainage which had previously been disposed of on the surface. All this had to seek an outlet somewhere, except in those rare instances where it maintains its downward course until, below the level of any open stream it can reach, it encounters an impervious stratum and must lose itself in the deep rocks. Usually, however, it emerges in the face of a bluff or on the side of a hill, and the opening becomes the mouth of a cave. Occasionally, in such situations, the water continues to flow out, but usually it finds a way to reach a lower level, and so the cave in time becomes dry except for such water as seeps through from the earth immediately above. Sometimes, too, the point of discharge is at or perhaps somewhat below the level of a stream into which it passes. In the Ozarks are numerous very large springs or fountains which by inverted siphon or artesian action are forced up from subterranean streams lying at a greater depth. Few large caverns have the floor entirely dry, even when they are well above the bottom of the valley. Deposits in the front portion may be dry, perhaps dusty on the surface, but toward the interior moisture usually accumulates until they are muddy or until the water stands in pools or puddles. When this is the case, there is sometimes a little stream making its way to the front through a channel which it has cut, or seepage may dampen, possibly saturate, the lowermost portions of the otherwise dry earth. These details are controlled principally by the direction and degree of slopes and by side openings which allow more or less of the water to escape at some part of its journey. 
When a cavern is fairly lighted and has a dry floor, whether of rock or earth, it forms an excellent abode for a small community unable or not disposed to construct shelters more comfortable or convenient, and there is abundant evidence that many caves in the Ozarks were utilized as habitations by the Aborigines. It must be remembered, however, that in the centuries which have elapsed since hunters or permanent occupants first entered this region, many superficial changes have taken place, not only about the entrances but within the caverns as well. Very probably these alterations have converted caves once occupied into places which at present are quite unfit for such purposes. Talus has accumulated in front of the openings or partially filled the front chambers, it may well be the case that this conceals much refuse. Caves which, from similar deposits, are now difficult to enter and dark to the doorway, may have been open and convenient. Furthermore, caves with wet or muddy bottoms may owe such condition to causes which have recently come into operation, or if they always contained more or less water, the primitive dwellers could in many cases have overcome such disadvantages by digging drains which have since become choked and obliterated. Very small cavities, such as deep rock shelters, or caverns with a great thickness of earth on the floors, now showing no trace of remains, or those with entrances so small that it is necessary to crawl through, any of these, if cleared out to the bottoms, might disclose material dating back to very early times. It might seem that the air in a cave constantly occupied would grow still and close, while smoke from the fires would in time become annoying. But Indians used for fuel only dry wood and bark, the smoke from which would be a negligible factor. The varying pressure of the atmosphere outside creates a current of air in or out which is usually imperceptible but which penetrates to the deepest recesses and ensures ventilation. In view of the very primitive conditions under which cave dwellers lived, as denoted by the artificial objects which they left, and the low mentality indicated by the skulls, Mr. W. H. Holmes suggests that a careful and extended study of these abodes may disclose a culture lower than that prevailing among outdoor dwellers in the same localities. As no effort would be required to secure warmth and shelter, and as food was abundant and easily procured, the people may never have advanced from savagery or may have retrograde. None of these possibilities are taken into account when reporting upon the caves described in the following pages. The information offered is based entirely upon the present appearance of the places mentioned. To attempt more would be merely offering guesses. If caveman, using this term to designate the predecessor of any race or tribe known to history, ever existed in the Mississippi Valley, he would not find in any part of the natural features better adapted for his requirements than in the Ozark Hills. But, so far, not the slightest trace of his presence has been revealed. Products of human industry have been reported as occurring at great depths under other conditions, even at the bottom of the loss, though in all such cases there is some uncertainty as to the correctness of the observations. No similar reports have been made in regard to any cave yet explored. On the contrary, whatever may be the depth of the deposit containing them, the artificial objects exhumed are uniform in character from top to bottom, the specimens fell on the clay or solid rock floor are of the same class as those barely covered by the surface earth. Moreover, when they cease to appear they cease absolutely, the rock was swept bare, or the clay was deposited by the stream to which the cave owes its existence, and each is a part of the original formation. In these circumstances, habitation would be out of the question. By careful search in the caves and rock shelters of which the Indian known to history availed himself, extensive and interesting museum collections can be made. To find an earlier man it will be necessary to investigate caverns which he found suitable for occupancy and in which the accumulation of detritus, from whatever source, has been sufficient to cover his remains so deeply that they cannot be confused with those of a later period, and it may be necessary, also, to discover with them bones of extinct animals. 
Should such a place exist, it is extremely probable that there will be no outward indication of the fact. No examination of a cavern is complete or is to be deemed satisfactory unless a depth is reached where the geological deposits are undeniably of such age as to antedate the possible appearance of man upon the scene. This is not assured until the excavation has reached the original floor, which may be either the bedrock or the clay left by the eroding stream when its volume had become so diminished from any cause that it was no longer able to keep its channel cleared out. Unless a cave is almost perfectly dry, and few of them are, the bottom cannot be reached until all standing or soil water has been drained off. Notwithstanding the most explicit directions, a stranger without a guide is frequently unable to find a cave unless its position is plainly visible from some well-defined spot. The winding valleys and the multitude of ravines sometimes bewilder even those living among them. A few definitions of terms or explanations of statements in the report may prevent misunderstanding. Refuse, signs, indications, evidence, referring to habitation or occupancy, mean muscle shells, animal bones, burned or worked stones, broken pottery, wrought objects of bone or shell, flint implements, chips or spalls, ashes, charcoal, in short, the material ordinarily found on the side of an Indian village, some or all of which are to be seen where the caverns have been used for shelter. Daylight or in daylight is the greatest distance within the entrance to a cavern at which common print may be easily read or the nature of small objects lying on the floor determined with certainty. Drip rock, cave rock, or cave formation are general terms including stalactite or stalagmite, also deposits of similar origin coating the walls. Not all of these may be present in the same cavern. Roof dust is a substance, literally lime sand, produced by the superficial disintegration of the roof or walls. This process is greatly accelerated where lichen or rock moss has gained a root hold on the stone. Roof dust in a dry cavern is the equivalent of stalagmite in a wet one. Cave earth is the loose, lonely material usually found in the front chambers of large caverns. It is made up of roof dust, sand, and silt washed from the interior, outside dust and vegetable matter blown in by the wind with many amounts of clay or soil carried in by animals. Gravel in a cavern is seldom noticeably waterworn, but is the angular debris resulting from the continued fragmentation of chert nodules released by erosion of the limestone. A rock shelter, or shelter cave, is a room or recess formed by atmospheric erosion in the face, usually at the base, of a cliff. The depth from front to back under the projecting or overhanging unremoved bedrock above is generally much less than the length as measured along the face of the bluff. They are nearly always dry, more or less protected from storms, and when of suitable size and in a favorable location were much used as camping places. They are rather rare in limestone formations but frequent in massive sandstone. House mounds are small, low piles of earth, similar in all respects to those so numerous in southeastern Missouri and southward. Although they are usually described as standing in regular rows, they are in fact irregularly placed, though seldom as much as 100 feet apart in the same group. Measurements of caverns explored were made with a tape line, others were estimated by stepping, or in the case of elevations, by sighting, consequently are only approximate, but the figures given will in no case exceed the actual distance. Specimens reported from caves not excavated were found on the floor, sometimes in situations where no addition of cave earth had taken place since the objects were left there, and other times where they were brought from below by burrowing animals, and, again, where they are exposed in the bed or banks of a drainage channel. In no cave so far examined has any evidence been found to show that the Aborigines occupied any part of it beyond such point as was adequately illuminated from the entrance. No doubt they may, 
at times, have retreated beyond the reach of daylight and been compelled to dispel the darkness by means of fires, but such instances were rare and of short duration. Statements are sometimes made that specimens, usually flint implements, have been found far, possibly several hundred yards, within the cavern. Such objects do not predicate habitation at that distance, primitive explorers may have lost them. It has been pointed out, too, by Mr. Delancey Gill, that a wounded animal, taking refuge in a cave and instinctively seeking its dark recesses, may carry in an arrow or spear whose point remains when the shaft has decayed. In the case of a large mammal, such as a bear or a panther, a number of arrow or spearheads might be carried in and be found close together long after the death of the victim. Cairns or stone-covered graves are of common occurrence, but with a single exception the rocks and all those visited or reported are more or less displaced. This is due to hunters digging out small wild animals making a den in them, to treasure seekers who believe that money is concealed in them, and most of all to persons who are curious to know what there is in there. The record of the investigations will be given by counties, beginning at the south and proceeding northward. Descriptions and notes of the sites mentioned will follow as closely as possible the same arrangement. A number following the name of a cave refers to its position as denoted by a corresponding number on the map, PL3. The Upper Current River. A number of well-known caverns, some of them quite extensive, exist along the head streams forming the Current River. As originally planned, the work included a thorough survey of this region, but owing to various causes it was only partially examined. Several large caves were reported as being along the river and its tributaries farther down than these researches were carried. Notable is one opposite the mouth of Sinking Creek, which was described as dry and very large within, but it was also stated that it can only be entered through a sinkhole with the aid of a ladder or pole 30 feet long. Such a cave is not likely to have been used for shelter. Others, as they were described, seemed equally unfitted for this purpose. The only exception to this general rule is one in Spring Valley south of the current and east of Sinkin. Such as were visited will be described in their geographical order. Shannon County Bat Cave 1 This cavern is six miles above the mouth of Sinkin. It is near the top of a cliff fully 300 feet above the river. The entrance is 30 feet wide and 10 feet high. Within is a level earth covered floor. Being very difficult of access, it was probably never inhabited. Blue Spring or Fishing Cave 1. This is situated on the Terrell land for miles below Acres Post Office. The entrance 10 feet high and 20 feet wide is almost at low water level. The river at flood height rises fully 20 feet above its top. 50 feet within is a spring or well, 20 feet across, whose bottom is beyond the reach of a line 60 feet long. It is said that eyeless fish of three pounds weight have been caught in this blue spring. Welch's Cave. This is four miles below Cedar Grove. It can be entered only in a boat, and the entire floor is deeply covered with soft mud. Big Creek Cave There is a cave at the mouth of Big Creek which is often used as a temporary camping place by hunters and fishermen. The water enters it whenever there is a freshet in either the creek or the river, so it could never have served as a place of permanent abode. Plate 3 Map of Area Examined Texas County Smith Caves On James the First Smith's Land on Big Creek a mile above Niles are three caves. One is merely a round opening five feet in width and height so narrowing to a crevice. It would not be mentioned except that it was a sandstone slab such as mortars are made of. This bore no marks of use but it had been carried in for some purpose 
possibly by white men. The second cave, 50 feet from the first, has an entrance 20 feet wide and 4 to 5 feet high. Dry earth extends back for 40 feet, then come clay and fallen rocks, sloping downward toward the rear. The roof maintains its level as far as followed. No trace of occupation could be found. The third cave, 150 yards from the second, has an entrance 35 feet wide and 20 feet high. Dry cave earth appears for 20 feet, at which distance it merges with mud containing large rocks. The cavern extends for 50 feet in daylight. Water from the interior spreads over the whole floor to the inner margin of dry earth, where it collects in a little stream which passes out along the foot of one wall. The earth deposit seems to be thin. The only objects that could be found in the cave or about the entrance were a small sandstone slab, unmarked, a small piece of deer bone, and one fragment of shell-tempered pottery. Now a flake of flint was seen. These caves are not worth working. A fourth of a mile from the cave last mentioned is a rock grave on a ledge which projects at about 40 feet, vertically, below the top of the hill. As near as can be judged, in its present torn up condition, the cairn was originally about 10 by 20 feet in dimensions, so there were probably two graves covered by the ordinary conical heaps of stone, the depression between them being filled up to form a single cairn. Saltpeter Cave Five miles west of Montauk, on Ashley Creek, is a cave noted for having two entrances which are separated by a triangular mass of rock, part of the original formation. This partition measures 30 feet across at the face of the bluff and terminates within 20 feet. The principal opening is 90 feet wide and 15 feet high. Dry cave earth extends back 90 feet, at which distance water constantly falls from the roof and flows along the foot of one wall through the minor entrance. The ladder is 30 feet wide, 10 feet high and its bottom is 10 feet lower than that of the main opening. The volume of water passing out varies with the seasons, but is sufficient at times to cover the entire floor of the side chamber and keep it swept free of earth and small gravel. In the front portion of the main cavern the dry earth is 5 feet deep in its thickest part, but as it has all been leached for obtaining the saltpeter or niter diffused through it, none of it is in the original position. Some earth has also been brought from farther back, leached, and added to the pile in front, and much of this has been hauled out for fertilizer. Near the main entrance is a large mass of breccia made up of small angular limestone fragments cemented throughout with stalagmite material. It projects several feet above the present level of the earth floor, so the character of the cavern must have changed greatly since this deposit was formed. The only artificial object found was a fragment, about an inch across, of dark, sand-tempered pottery. Owing to the extensive changes resulting from collecting the saltpeter, the cavern would not repay investigation. Dent County Mammoth Cave The statement has been made that a large dry cavern, known as the Mammoth Cave, is in a bluff facing Curran River opposite the mouth of Ashley Creek. It could not be located, and residents in the vicinity assert that not only is there no cave near this site, but there is none known as mammoth anywhere in the region. Some of them, however, had a vague idea that a cavern bearing the same name exists away down toward eminence, it may be on Jack's Fork. Guthorl Cave There is a cave on the farm of Peter Guthorl, six miles east of Salem. It is small with very little level space in front of it, and water from the interior runs or seeps out of it, keeping the floor muddy throughout the year. Short Bend Cave Short Bend Post Office is 12 miles northeast of Salem. Half a mile east of it, in a bluff on the opposite side of the Merrimack River, is a cave with an entrance 25 feet wide and about the same in height, the roof forming a fairly symmetrical gothic arch were it not for the pile of talus in front, 
Water from the river would pour into the cavern in extreme floods. These subside very rapidly, however, and have never percolated through the barrier. It is said that persons digging in a desultory way have unearthed bones which were assumed to be those of Indians because they were red. No description of them could be obtained, and they may not have been human bones at all. The floor is level and dry for about 80 feet back from the entrance, but no refuse of any kind appeared except in the pile of talus outside, which showed a small quantity of flint chips such as would be left by hunting parties and repairing their weapons. Money Cave This is a fourth of a mile down the river from Short Bend Cave. It takes its name from the customary tradition that Indians conceal the large treasure here, the legend being authenticated by an Indian chief who told a white man that his people had buried much gold in a cave in this bluff, built a fire over the money, then filled the mouth of the cave with earth and rock. Some of the persons who opened many small holes in searching for the hidden wealth claimed to have found ashes in this cave, behind the barrier, which is only ordinary talus. The floor is of tough clay, fallen rocks, and stalagmite, all of which, as well as the walls and ledges, were industriously dug and hammered for months by the treasure seekers. A cave with an entrance 15 feet wide, the same in height, and having a depth of 45 feet in daylight, lies between Money Cave and Short Bend Cave. In very wet seasons water runs through it from the interior, and high water backs into it from the Merrimack River. Saltpeter Cave This is three-fourths of a mile north of Short Bend Post Office, on the opposite side of the river. The arched entrance is 25 feet wide and 20 feet high. 15 feet from the front the cave divides into two branches about equal in size. They have never been explored to the end. One branch continues straight back for about 100 feet, then turns abruptly to the right for 50 or 60 feet, at which distance it resumes its original direction. The other branch turns directly to the right and is in daylight for 50 feet. Much of the cave earth has been hauled away for fertilizer or leached for obtaining saltpeter so that only a small quantity remains in front. Farther back, in both chambers, the dry earth were not disturbed is 8 to 10 feet thick. The cavern is easily accessible, close to the river, and otherwise well adapted for habitation but careful search failed to reveal any indication that it had ever been thus used. Watson, Twin, or Onyx Caves The two caverns thus variously designated are on the Merrimack River, 14 miles north of Salem. They are parallel to a depth of about 100 feet, being separated by only 10 or 12 feet of solid wall. The floors of both slope downward from front to rear, but not so rapidly as the roof, so that at this distance the caves apparently come to an end. But that they continue back into the hill is manifest from the appearance of the roofs. In some manner the rear portion of each has become entirely filled with earth. Probably they unite somewhere beyond this point. Either of these caves is of ample size to make an excellent shelter for a large number of people, but they are difficult of access and no evidence whatever could be discovered indicating occupancy. In fact, this part of the Merrimack Valley does not seem to have ever been permanently inhabited. Residents say that relics, even flint implements, are seldom found in the bottom lands, and this fact was commented on by persons who have learned how common such things are in other localities. Small, rough hematite axes however, occur in considerable quantities throughout the region. The or outcrops at various places and solid nodules or fragments are plentiful. Churred knives or spearheads are found scattered promiscuously and, rarely, an object made of other stone may be picked up. Very few specimens of any description are symmetrical or carefully finished. House Mounds 5 on the Dent County Infirmary Farm in Spring Creek Valley, 
A mile and a half south of Salem is a group of house mounds, about 50 in number. They have not been much disturbed by cultivation. The creek and a drainage ditch have cut through several of them, but, as usual, there is nothing in the construction to show their purpose. Two similar groups are on the Short Bend Road, not far from Salem, another group on Peter Guthorl's farm six miles east of Salem, and a fourth group, partly within the corporate limits of Salem, on the road to Rolla. Phelps County Bates Cave On the farm of J.W. Ridden, six miles southeast of Big Piney Post Office, is Bates Cave, of which every visitor to the region is speedily informed. It is entered with difficulty by sliding feet first down the inner slope of a pile of debris which fills the entrance almost to the roof. Once beyond this, there is ample space. On the hillside, above the mouth, is a vertical shaft, like a well, due to the widening of a crevice, access to the interior of the cave may also be had through this by means of a long rope. Under present conditions, it would not be used except as a temporary shelter or hiding place, for which purposes bushwhackers availed themselves of its advantages during the Civil War. This cavern is renowned far beyond its merits on account of its famous ballroom, where dances and picnics are held, artificial lights being placed on the walls. Possibly the manner in which it must be entered has something to do with its popularity. Another Bates Cave Within a few rods of the cave above described is another, with an entrance 60 feet wide and 10 feet high. Cave Earth, which is 5 feet thick above the bottom of a small stream coming from the interior, extends back to large rocks covering the floor. Beyond these are rocks, wet clay, and gravel. The cave earth seems to run for some distance under the receding walls. A milk house has been constructed in it, so that excavations are not permitted. Renault Cave For miles east of Edgar Springs, facing Little Piney, is Renault, Renault, Cave, on the farm of Charles E. Widener. The entrance is 50 feet wide and 10 feet high. Dry cave earth extends back for 65 feet, then comes fallen rock for 100 feet or more. A little stream runs close to the north wall. Cave earth is five feet deep on the bedrock at the entrance and rises toward the interior. There is much refuse within and also on the slope in front of the entrance. Marsh Caves A shelter cave on Henry Marsh's farm, facing Little Piney, two miles south of Yancey Mills, has a front 35 feet wide, 15 feet high, and runs back 60 feet. There is a wet weather stream bed through the center. Bedrock shows at the entrance, rising toward the rear for a few feet, then becoming covered with cave earth, which probably has a maximum thickness of two feet. There is considerable refuse scattered about, but it is doubtful whether the shallow deposit would repay investigation. Wild Hog Cave a fourth of a mile from the above cave is one known as Wild Hog Cave because in pioneer days these animals gathered here for shelter and protection. It is a small, tunnel-like affair with a solid rock floor and extends farther into the hill than anyone has ever dared to venture. Shelters Two small rock shelters near the Wild Hog Cave may have been resorted to as temporary camping places. Phelps Cave A cave on the farm of James Phelps, two miles south of Yancey Mills, is described as small, with a narrow entrance. Key Rocks Near Yancey Mills there is something known as the Key Rocks. It cannot be found by a stranger and no guide was available at the time the place was sought. It is described as a small, deep, circular hole in solid rock in which were many stone covers or lids, one above another, gradually diminishing in size and cut to fit down on each other. It is probably due to stream erosion. Jones Cave On Little Piney, 
half a mile south from Yancey Mills, is a large cave on the Jones Farm. It is said to have a large entrance and much earth on the floor. As the owner uses it for a warehouse in which to store fruits and vegetables and utilizes the stream flowing through it for preserving milk and butter, no examination could be made. Yancey Mills Cave There is a small, shallow cave near the top of the bluff, half a mile north of Yancey Mills. It contains no evidence of occupation, except that walls and ceiling are blackened with smoke, too, probably, to modern refugees or hunters. Lane Mound, 7. It was reported, too late to visit the site, that on George Lane's farm, on Little Piney, a mile north of Yancey Mills, is a mound eight feet high, built of earth, and surrounded with the usual evidences of a village site, scattered over the level bottom on which it stands. Cairns on Lost Hill, at mouth of Gord Creek, 8. Gord Creek flows into the east side of Little Piney River 12 miles southwest of Rolla. It is less than 4 miles long and but for 3 or 4 large springs near its source, which keep its volume fairly uniform, would be dry most of the year. Parallel with it, a short distance to the southward, is a ravine several miles in length known as Coal Pit Hollow. This originally discharged its drainage into Little Piney about half a mile above the mouth of Gort Creek. A ravine tributary to the latter, near its mouth, has worked back until it has captured the flow of coal pit. The lower end of the stream bed thus abandoned now forms a gap or depression with a slight incline from the center in both directions. The crest of the deserted portion is about 50 to 60 feet above the present level of Little Piney. The hill enclosed by this quadrilateral drainage is about a fourth of a mile in length along its top, has a direction almost north and south, with a nearly uniform slope along the summit, the southern point being somewhat higher than that at the north, and terminates abruptly at each end. The sides descend at once from the center line of the ridge, like a roof with a slightly rounded comb. On account of its isolated position, the eminence is locally known as Lost Hill. It is not to be confused, however, with several similar formations in this region to which the same term is applied and which may owe their existence to a like cause or may be due to cutoffs by streams. On the top of this particular Lost Hill are six cairns, five of them near the northern end the sixth just where the ridge breaks off to the south. The margins are uncertain owing to the upper stones being scattered by hunters as well as by credulous individuals who are firmly fixed in the belief that all such rock piles contain gold hidden by Indians. So far as can now be determined the five at the northern end were 16 to 18 feet across as left by the builders, the southernmost one being somewhat smaller. All are in uncleared land and crevices between the stones are filled with a tangled mass of roots from the trees and bushes growing on and around them. The relative positions are about thus, measurements being made on the earth between the scattered stones, 1, 10 feet, 2, 10 feet, 3, 50 feet, 4, 10 feet, 5, 1000 feet, 6, the distance from 5, to 6 is estimated by stepping and may vary considerably either way from the measure given. Cairns 1, 2, and 3 were thoroughly excavated. Cairn 1 This, the farthest north, was about 16 by 17 feet within the original limits. When the outer loose rocks were removed, there was disclosed a wall of flat stones on the natural surface, so laid as to form an enclosure apparently intended to be practically square. It measured, across the center, from outside to outside, about 14 feet from north to south by 12 feet from east to west. The north and south walls were straight, the others outwardly curved. The approximate outline is shown in figure one. In most parts the wall was only one stone high, in a few places there was another rock laid up. 
Over and within this wall had been piled loose stones, ranging in size from small pebbles to fragments of 150 pounds in weight to form a heap whose original height was about two feet. When all these were cleared away, the space within the wall was found to measure nine feet in each direction. Three feet from the middle of the west wall was a fragment of a child's skull lying on the undisturbed angular gravel which forms the natural surface on this ridge except where a small amount of recently decayed humus may be held by rocks and roots. Halfway between the center and the north wall was the top of an adult skull with three fragments of long bones. These, which were much gnawed by rodents, were in black earth, evidently the former home of some burrowing animal. A foot north of the infant skull were small remnants of an adult skull, probably belonging with the piece first found. There were also some scraps of animal bones, much gnawed. Cairn, too. This measured from 16 to 18 feet across to the outer edge of the loose stones and about 30 inches high. Under the top rocks was a rough wall similar to that in Cairn, one, but all the sides were nearly straight. The outline is given in figure two. The outside measurements across the center were 15 feet each way. There were more stones in this wall than in the first, mostly there were two, and in some places three, superposed. Extending from north to south across the middle of the vault was a row of large slabs standing on edge with their tops leaning toward the east. Their inclination varied from nearly horizontal to nearly vertical, so it would appear that they were not placed thus intentionally but had settled irregularly. Probably they had formed the covering of a pen or vault of poles or timbers in which a body had been placed. Close to these inclined slabs, near the north wall of the vault, was the effigy pipe shown in figure three. It is made of a fine-grained sandstone and seems intended to represent a buzzard with an exaggerated tail, though the beak is more like that of a crow. This specimen lay between two flat rocks which were separated by a little earth and gravel, but there were no traces of bone with it or near it. At a slightly lower level than the pipe were several flat stones standing at various angles. When these were removed, there were found fragmentary remains of at least three adults lying in confusion as if only the folded dismembered skeletons had been placed here. They lay on a floor of slabs which, in turn, rested upon undisturbed gravel. The facts observed are difficult to interpret as the original order was so broken up, but it would seem that as a preliminary to the burial of bodies or skeletons, the superficial earth had been scraped away and a rough stone floor laid on which the bundled or folded remains were placed and at least partially covered with earth and gravel. Other flat rocks were then laid over them either directly on the earth or more probably supported by poles placed across whose decay had allowed them to fall into the confusion in which they were found. The pipe, being at a little distance from these bones, would suggest another interment, but as no trace of such remained it may have been placed as an afterthought or a separate deposit. From these skeletons row after row of the slanting rocks continued to the inner side of the eastern wall. Two feet east of the pipe was a skull on its right side the back against a small flat rock. It was crushed flat and only a small part of it remained. Possibly it had turned after burial as fragments of other bones were found here and there toward the south from it, indicating an extended burial. The teeth were hard, solid and much worn. The bones found were more or less gnawed and among them were scraps, probably of food animals burned into charcoal. No bones found could be saved as they were very soft. Cairn, three. This was similar in construction to one and two as is shown in figure four. The wall along the outside measured 14 feet on the south, 13 feet on the north, 15 feet on the west and 14 feet on the east. The enclosed space was 10 feet across each way. 
Someone had dug out much of the south end, the northern end was undisturbed. The prior excavation had barely missed, near the west wall, a few fragments of an adult skull and three teeth. About even with the middle point of the west wall, two feet from it, was evidence of the burial of an adult, pieces of bone and skull and some teeth. North of these, near the northwest corner, were fragments of two adult skulls, with one of which were some beads made of shells of water snails. Eighteen of these were recovered, all more or less decayed. Between these two skulls were parts of a child's skull, the teeth not yet through the bone. Inclined flat stones in the eastern half of the grave, the tops leaning eastward, denoted other burials, but nothing was found under them, although small flat stones laid on the original surface indicated the bottom of a grave. Evidently several burials, of which all traces have disappeared, were made in this vault. Owing to the practical identity of these three graves, the poor returns, and the difficulty of working in a tangled mass of tough roots without displacing the stones so greatly that their proper position became a perplexing question, the remaining three were not excavated. Exploration of the Gord Creek Cave 8 Near the mouth of Gord Creek, on the north side, is a cave which has acquired much local reputation from its size and also from the evidence it affords of a long-continued occupation by the Aborigines. It is easily reached from the road which passes in front, wagons can be driven into it and there is ample space for them to turn and pass out. Formerly it was much resorted to as a pleasant place for social gatherings, but in recent years it has been used as a barn and storehouse. The owner, Mr. Valentine Allen, gave cheerful permission for all the excavation that was desired, subject only to the proviso that the floor be put back in condition suitable for the purposes for which he needed it. And it is only fair to state that he was not at all difficult to satisfy in this respect. A stream coming from the interior had a flow at the close of the long drought in 1918 sufficient to fill a two-inch pipe with a rapid fall. In wet seasons the water spreads from wall to wall until it comes to within 100 feet of the mouth. Back in the cave, where the slope is greater, it has sufficient volume and force to carry away all pebbles smaller than coarse gravel and the material that finds lodgment among the stones. The cave is easily traversed for almost 600 feet. Beyond this are narrow crevices and tortuous passages where explorers must frequently crawl or clamber. One adventurous party proceeded until they reached an opening on the other side of the hill, but this was so choked by fallen rock and debris from the hillside as to be impassable. In storms a strong breeze passes through the main entrance in or out in accordance with the direction of the wind. Owing to the irregular outline of the cliffs, the width of the entrance cannot be accurately given. From side to side, while under the front of the ceiling the distance is 110 feet. 200 feet toward the interior it contracts to 50 feet. At the entrance the walls are vertical to a height of 25 feet, a short curve at the top on either side due to the breaking away of the ledges, connects them with the roof, which is somewhat higher. Being a single massive stratum, the top is practically horizontal, but the floor constantly rises from the front with a slight and fairly uniform grade. The front chamber is straight and well lighted for 300 feet, where it turns abruptly westward. From this point the floor is solid rock which the water keeps comparatively free from any loose matter except heavy blocks from the walls or top. Beginning at the entrance is a deposit whose farthest extension reaches 100 feet into the cavern. It is composed to a small extent of sand and clay carried by the stream and of earth blown or washed in from the outside, but, as investigation proved, it is mainly ashes from prehistoric fires. The surface of this deposit, especially toward the inner end, is very uneven, being higher near the walls than through the central portion. This is due to two causes. In very wet seasons water has carried away much of it, 
and a large amount has been hauled out by the owner to scatter over his fields as a fertilizer. He reports that in the course of this work he found quantities of pottery fragments, broken bones, flints, and two or three human skeletons with fragments of others. This is the basis for the assertion, frequently heard, that many or very many burials had been made here. The only human remains which he saved are the complete skull of an adult, remarkably preserved and apparently that of a white woman, a rather large lower jaw of a man, a few long bones, and parts of skulls and jaws of three or four children. From comments made and questions asked by visitors while the investigation was in progress, it seems that bones and teeth of deer and other animals are mistaken for those of people. No human bones were uncovered in this work, except as noted below. There is a firm belief in the community that somewhere in this cave is concealed $100,000 in gold, seven pony loads in all, which was put here by an old squaw, sole survivor of a massacre by which her tribe was exterminated. Much of the irregularity of surface noted in the deposits is due to the efforts of persons trying to find this money. Before starting the work, it was necessary to deepen the little stream, which had cut its way through the accumulation much nearer to the western than to the eastern wall of the cavern in order to allow the water to run out of the lower end of the deposit. Thorough drainage of the whole mass was impossible as water continually seeped in from the gravel bed farther up, a condition which could not be remedied. Bedrock was reached at a depth of three feet below the channel. The lower two feet of this distance was through a black, mucky substance which was so tough and sticky that removing it was like digging through a bog. Following the bedrock as a floor, the western side of the deposit was first examined. It had a width of 35 feet at the mouth of the cave, gradually narrowing inward for a distance of 75 feet where it terminated at the level of the water. Its greatest elevation at the side of the entrance was about 10 feet, but this does not mean that its thickness was so much at any point as the rock sloped upward quite as rapidly as the surface. So many stones were scattered through it, fallen from the sides and roof, or rolled in from the outside where they had broken loose from the cliff, that not more than one fourth of the area could be excavated. These rocks varied in size from cobblestones to blocks weighing three or four tons. They were at all levels, some lying on the rock floor, others only slightly embedded in the earth. Yet this superficial accumulation extended under all of them except such as were in direct contact with the bedrock, proving that the cave was occupied throughout the period in which such downfalls occurred. An additional evidence of age is the fact that the usual debris, such as bones, flints, pottery, ashes, etc., lay in immediate contact with the bedrock where this has weathered to a chalky consistency from two to four inches in depth since these objects were left there. Owing to the uneven surface of both the bedrock and the deposits on it, the thickness of the latter varied from one to three feet, not including the muck, which last, however, disappeared at the level where the rock rose above the water line. But, whatever the depth, more than half the overlying material was pure ashes, either resting undisturbed on the fire beds or piled in irregular masses where they had been thrown to get them out of the way. The largest ash bed was near the wall. It measured from four to seven feet across with a very uneven outline as if many fires had been made there at different times. The objects discovered included flint knives, spearheads, arrowheads. Mostly broken, with many spalls and chips, potsherds, only very small pieces were found, animal bones, muscle shells, bone perforators, chert nodules, more or less flaked, two stone beads or buttons, a small fragment of a pipe, but no mortars, hammers, pestles, cooking stones, or hatchets, such as are usually found on the sites of Indian villages. None of the pottery was decorated, but most of it was cord-marked, 
though some of it was so smooth and polished as almost to appear glazed. It varied through a wide range of color, thickness, and general appearance and was noticeably deficient in quantity. In fact, the west side of the cave had less the appearance of a permanently occupied site than of a camping place which was used as a temporary resort by traveling or hunting parties, but at the same time the depth and amount of ashes showed that it had afforded shelter through a long period. The excavation on this side included all the space bounded by the ditch, the wall, the mass of rocks piled at the entrance, and the water-soaked earth toward the interior. The muck and the large blocks scattered around prevented a complete clearing out, but the part thoroughly examined had an area of about 600 square feet, perhaps a little more. No human bones were found, in spite of reports of their discovery and reburial by treasure hunters in the past, and there was wide disagreement on the part of visitors, who were also present when the bones were found, as to the number of such interments. All finally conceded that there was only one adult skull, though there was much argument as to the number of children's remains discovered, the person who was blessed with the largest memory insisting there were thirteen all in a pile. There was also some discussion as to whether the remains were actually found near the west wall or had been carried over there and reinterred after being exhumed on the east side. These particulars are given merely to show how little reliance is to be placed upon the statements of perfectly truthful persons who do not observe closely, whose memory plays them tricks, who are not especially interested in the matter under discussion, or whose recollections naturally become jumbled after several years have elapsed. Work was next begun on the east side, at the edge of the drainage trench. Bedrock was reached as before, under two feet of muck, and was weathered until quite soft and of a yellowish hue, for three or four inches below its surface. An effort was made to keep on the rock as a floor, removing all the muck, but this was so water-soaked, so tenacious, and so filled with chert and limestone gravel that it could not be managed with either pick or shovel. A little of the gravel had no doubt fallen from the roof, but nearly all of this mingled material had washed down from the interior as it was entirely similar, except for its dark color, to that forming the floor farther in. Consequently, it was necessary to limit the explorations to that part of the deposit which lay above the wet black mass. Numerous attempts were made to ascertain the thickness of the latter, but water, gravel, and slush used or slid into the hole as fast as they could be removed and it was impossible to reach the bottom. The eastward dip of the rock floor, as noted on the western side of the cave, no doubt continues entirely across. If such be the case, then the original drainage line was against the foot of the eastern wall. Later, because the channel was obstructed by talus, the stream was forced more and more to the west, saturating, up to the level of its final outlet, the earth and ashes which had accumulated. It may be, however, that either this line of drainage or the mass of talus in front of the cave is of comparatively recent origin. Such accumulations as those described would be impossible under present conditions. At any rate, this deposit of muck, then dry, started from the floor of the cave with the earliest occupation for artificial objects of the same character that occurred in the dry deposit above were found in it to a depth of three or four inches. They may continue to the bedrock, but on account of the standing water no satisfactory observations could be made below the level indicated. Lying above the muck and, as intimated, practically continuous with it, was an accumulation of ashes with which here and there some earth was mingled, though the latter made only a small proportion of the entire mass, and was sometimes entirely lacking from top to bottom. They were principally in strata or irregular layers, lying undisturbed where fires had been made, but there were also many scattered piles, usually small, where they had been thrown to get them out of the way. The excavation on the eastern side began with a trench 25 feet wide. 
When this had been carried about the same distance toward the wall, rocks and earth rolled and washed in from the outside were encountered on the right, the side toward the mouth of the cavern. These reached from the bottom to the surface and were continuous with the bank of talus. As results had been meager along here, the sides of the trench were turned to the northward and northwestward. The entire trench was 43 feet long and varied in width from 30 feet in the central parts to 18 feet at the extreme northern end. The left face reached, in its entire length, nearly to the drain. On the right side the eastern wall of the cavern was uncovered for 15 feet. It embraced nearly all the area not previously dug by others, except a triangular space at the east side of the entrance filled with large stones, as just stated. Near the middle of the excavated area was a heap of large fallen rocks, fully a carload in all, some of them embedded in the muck, others barely penetrating the surface of the latest deposits. Ashes lay under and between all of them, proving this site also had been inhabited before the first of them had become loose and that occupancy was practically continuous until the last one had fallen. The inmates, recognizing the danger, may have knocked these down. The greatest depth of ashes found in any part of the excavation was seven feet, but it may have been greater previous to any disturbance, nor does this include such as may be present in the muck. There were unbroken layers as much as eight inches thick covering spaces five to ten feet across, many smaller, intact patches, and numerous masses from a peck to a bushel in volume removed from fire beds elsewhere. Charcoal among them showed that bark and dead wood, principally oak, was the main reliance for fuel. The wrought objects found were flints, mostly broken or of rough finish, very many small fragments of pottery, mortars made of sandstone slabs, hammerstones or pestles, bone perforators, muscle shells, some pierced for suspension or for attachment of a handle, some with outer surfaces and edges dressed for use as spoons, hematite or in the rough or rub to procure paint. There was a great abundance of bones from animals used for food, mostly deer, though elk, bear, many smaller mammals, turtles, tortoises, turkeys, and other birds were well represented. Singularly enough, when the plentiful supply of fish in all the streams of this region is considered, none of their bones or scales were found, although the ashes would have preserved them perfectly. Nor were there many burned rocks, in view of the amount of pottery and the number of bones which showed that they had been boiled. Perhaps such stones had crumbled or were thrown outside when near disintegration. There is a consensus of belief, or at least a statement, in the neighborhood that many human skeletons had been dug out close to the east wall. In the only part reached during this work, which took in about all that had not been searched by others, rocks lay along the wall, so large and so numerous that no graves could have, 34, been dug behind or between them. By careful and persistent questioning it was established that skeletons had been found in two places and a detached jaw in another. A human skull, which was very soft and fell to pieces when uncovered, was found on and slightly pressed into the muck at a point 15 feet from the wall. There were no other bones about it, though a rough stone hammer, whose presence was probably accidental, lay close by. A single human molar was lying among some ashes. These were the only human remains found during the work, except two adult femurs of different individuals, and fragments of a skull and some other bones from a child and from an infant, all of which lay close to the wall where they had been thrown and slightly covered by parties previously working here. As the depth of the wet material on the rock floor of the eastern side of this cavern is unknown, interesting results might be obtained by a careful examination of it, but this cannot be made until a ditch is dug through a sufficient depth to drain it thoroughly. Slight investigation outside the entrance showed a large amount of broken bones, pottery, and flint, and this dump may contain even more material than was found in an equal volume in the cavern. 
but in addition to the rocks of all sizes broken off from the cliff, there were also many which had rolled down from the hillside above, and all these were so interlaced with roots as to make digging very difficult and unsatisfactory. Consequently, further exploration at this site was deemed undesirable. Pointed bone and antler implements from Gourd Creek Cave are shown in Plate 4. A shell knife, a bead from a fragment of seashell, and types of flint arrowheads appear in Plate 5. There is a village site on Gourd Creek Bottom at the foot of Lost Hill and a little below the cave. Three small earth mounds are plowed nearly level. A small village site is located on the east bank of Little Piney, half a mile below Gourd Creek. In the bluff facing Little Piney, a mile below Gourd Creek, on the opposite side, is a small, shallow cave with a low roof. Water cracks on the floor show that it is sometimes flooded. No signs of use are apparent. On the hill over the cave just mentioned is a cairn, now destroyed. 